Nancy Kwa. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Jim, for the kind words. Um, before we start, I just want to say that a member of the FCC club couldn't make it tonight because he said he was gone. He was going to visit the real Suzy Wong in Wan Chai. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, well, where should I start? Oh, the documentary, our documentary that took four years to produce um, is finally completed. And it's going to be shown on Monday at the convention center. So I hope some of you can join us at 9.30 in the morning. So get up early and join us. Um, what else? It took, us, it took us four years to make, and Brian Jameson, the producer director, sitting right down there. Thank you, Brian. He did a wonderful job, I must say. We shot in some wonderful locations in uh, this documentary. Of course, Hong Kong, being back here. We came back when they had the performance of the Suzy Wong Ballet in Hong Kong. So we covered the ballet and intercut the ballet with the film that you will see. Um, what else? Then we, we filmed in Cambodia at Angkor Wat because there's a section in the documentary about my son. that He passed away. And it was a very difficult section because I really... I'm a very private person. It's not something that I can talk about. So Brian and I thought it would be a good place, going to a place like Angkor Wat, which is so beautiful and spiritual. And at the same time of all the genocide that's taken place in Cambodia, this contrast there, that I was able to speak about this incident. Um, uh, I'm surprised myself that I could actually talk about it. Going back to the documentary, when Brian Jameson first approached me to do this documentary on my life, I said to him, well, why do you want to do a documentary on my life? I mean, my life is not that interesting. And he said, I beg to differ. And so then we started to shoot the documentary. Um, are there any questions? I mean, do you want to do a Q&A? Or do you want to see the second part uh, of the film? What do you think, Jim? Did you want to talk about uh, the child that came first? Or yeah, OK. All right. I wanted to share with you, because being back in Hong Kong, every time I come back, Hong Kong has changed again. And I mean, it's constantly changing. And the other day, I was in Jim Sa looking for Moody Road, a street that I've known since childhood. And I couldn't find it. I could not find Moody Road. Very frustrating. Uh, so that's why I, I would like to share this with you of my childhood days in a very different Hong Kong. For those of you who don't know or have perhaps forgotten, Hong Kong means fragrant harbor in Chinese. The words invoke mystery and intrigue. Well, not quite. The bottom line is, show me the money. Money makes Hong Kong go round. Hong Kong is unique. It was born to the Chinese, leased by the British, and raised by the refugees, and now returned to the motherland. When I was growing up, Hong Kong was a small, laid-back seaport. We lived in a big white house designed by my father on Homington Hill. Surrounded by miles of open space, the pine-covered hill was our favorite playground. After school, we used to play ball in the street. In those days, there were hardly any traffic. I attended Marinol Common School. I just met someone who was from Marinol in Kowloon Tong. I remember I wanted to become a nun for the longest time. And whenever I asked my father about it, he'll say, well, wait, 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 wait till you get older. Just wait. And 
and 10 years later, much to everyone's surprise, including myself, I was playing a prostitute from Hong Kong in my first film, <laughs> The World of Susie Wong with William Holden. There's more, there's more. <laughs> Talk about changes. They came overnight. One afternoon, clad in the pajama popular in those days, I strolled down the hill to visit friends. The noise hit me first. I couldn't believe my eyes. People filled the street, and I couldn't understand a word they were saying. My friends explained that they were refugees from China. There were entire families sitting around, cooking, sleeping in cardboard boxes, and children running everywhere. I mean, it was extraordinary. Later, I discovered most were from Shanghai, speaking their own particular dialect. One family had moved under the stairwell in my friend's building. There were two girls our age, eight and 10, that we befriended. We would communicate in sign language, Cantonese, Shanghainese, and English, doing whatever we could to help. I gave them comic books from home. It was funny, they would sell, swap, and even rent them. Every day there would be four or five kids and grown-ups sitting on wooden benches reading comic books. The kids' parents loved American cigarettes. My father's brand was Lucky Strikes. Eventually I got caught stealing them. I remember confessing to my armor that I wasn't smoking. They were there for my refugee friends. We also supplied them with canned goods and chocolates for the girls. Everyone bought it for anything. Survival was their goal. Finally, this particular family moved into a one-room apartment, which they would share with more relatives from China. The circle had begun. The last time I was in Hong Kong, I got lost in Jin Zhe, unable to locate Moody Road, a street I've known since my childhood. Just in case the one country, two system doesn't work out, I'd like to offer a tourism promotional campaign. Ted Thomas, where are you? Listen up. Come visit Hong Kong, the spiritual center of Asia. Airfare, hotel, meals, and optional meditation sessions included. Bottled water free, but spiritual enlightenment not guaranteed. Thank you very much.